Next on BYUSN, which BYU football players are flying under the radar and are ready to make a big impact this season? And do we want BYU to resume rivalries with Utah State, Boise State, or look elsewhere to fill future schedules? Plus, former Cougar John Beck is with us. Talk Keaton Slovis, what he needs to do to get ready for week one. And cornerback Eddie Heckert gives us a look into how he prepares to be the leader of the defense this season. It's all coming up. Welcome to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Today is Friday, August 11th. My name is Jason Shepard, alongside a man who, in honor of Mason Wake, when he entered the studio, decided to leap over our camera operator. He is Dave McCann. And I now have two pulled hamstrings. <laughs> I was, was going to ask how the hammies I'm were out doing. for the season. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Mason announcing yesterday, uh, he's had some medical issues, and when you're hurt, football just isn't fun. And, yeah. then, and then it doesn't become worth it. And so he announced on Twitter that, uh, that he's out saying, uh, quote, what a ride it's been. With that being said, after many thoughts and prayers, I've decided to step away from football. I'm excited for what the future holds for me and for BYU football. So the leaper, the man who brought Chad Lewis back into style. That's right. Uh, is is done as a, a BYU football player and uh, and he he'll be remembered as a fun-loving, hard-working yeah. guy who jumped over folks and and the one of the coolest touchdowns we've seen in years. He was a part of uh, when they took on Houston a few years back. In fact, they borrowed the play from the Chiefs. Here it is, right here. Zach Wilson, a little flip. Oh yeah. To Wake, he goes in the end zone. And then he surprises everybody. Pulls out a note uh, for his mom uh, who had passed away. And um, anyway, what a, that, that moment right there will always be the Mason Wake moment. Yeah, well, he will always be remembered for, for leaping, and, and he leaned into it. Like, when he wouldn't leap over somebody, I was like, whoa, what, what's that? He could have leaped over him, could have jumped over him. But uh, we wish him nothing uh, but success as, uh, as he moves on. And uh, as we move on, all rise and shout, it's time for What's Trending. <laughs> Time now for What's Trending, presented by Feast Box, donating 10% of every order to Full of Hope, a charitable organization that feeds hungry families. Listen, I endorse the uh, wings, the uh, mashed potatoes, mm -hmm. and uh, the baked beans. There's, I believe it's bulgoga. I, I think that's like beef. I think that's how you say it. Yeah. Uh, delicious. It's very yeah, good. It's good. Yeah, it's good. delicious. I loved the wings. I'm like, hey, I totally order this. <laughs> All right. Anthony Miller is a writer for College Football Network, and he had Kingsley Suamataia as one of his five under the radar Big 12 players for 2023. Now, I'm not 100% sure how under the radar you are if you are a preseason All Big 12 yeah, and a guaranteed first round pick seems in the like NFL you're draft. On the radar, if that's yeah. The case. But. For the purpose of this show, uh, got us thinking about our under-the-radar players. So, who is your top under-the-radar BYU football player for 2023? I'm going with one of the most important players on the field, and it's not the quarterback. I'm talking about Aiden Robbins, the transfer from UNLV after the transfer from Louisville where he earned his degree. Um, I think he's under the radar because he's come from UNLV. He had 1,000 yards last season for the Rebels, but it was in the Mountain West Conference. And uh, so on the national scene, not a lot of guys know who Aiden Robbins is. But BYU is just thrilled with this guy. We were at practice the other day watching him run. He scored that touchdown and, and uh, just a beast. Connor Pay, the center, uh, told Blaine and I after practice that uh, – this guy is a difference maker in short yardage situations. He said, as an offensive line, we don't have to plow a hole for this guy. We just have to put, make a crease. And he's there, and at 230 pounds and 6'3", he can move the ball. Well, pile. BYU's issues with short yardage situations... Wasn't good last probably, year. Probably not going to be an issue this year with him. No. And here's a look at his numbers. I, I was talking to Jamal Willis earlier in the week. Now, he's number four all-time in rushing. Uh, 6'3", 230. Aiden Robbins, 6'3", 230, as he's listed. And, and Jamal said he'd worked with Aiden in the summer, and he said, if Aiden had four years, he would be the school's all-time leading rusher before he's done. He believes, Jamal Willis, that Robbins has everything it takes to be a game-changing running back who can also catch yeah. passes out of the backfield. And, uh, and Willis caught 77 
out of the backfield. He said that he had to learn how to catch because they were only going to hand off when Ty needed a break. <laughs> <laughs> the thing so he made himself useful. Yeah, the thing I really like about Aiden Robbins, it was one thing to look at his height and weight on paper, and you see highlights. But once fall camp started and you could actually get an opportunity to see him in action live, he's so much bigger and, and, yeah. not, and not just strength-wise, but taller than what I had imagined. So to be able to see what he's able to do and how strong he is and how powerful of a runner he is at his size – I, it got me even more excited about what's possible for him. And we're talking about under the radar. His, his center is 6'5". Yes. He's 6'3". Yeah, yeah. Coming in right behind him. He has not been under the radar for BYU for a long, long time. They were interested and, and thought they had a pretty good chance of getting him when he transferred from Louisville to UNLV. Yeah. So they have been on him for a while. And so. they were also on him before he went to Louisville. Yeah. Right? So you're right. They've been He's – He's known about BYU and yes. been a BYU fan for a long time. So it means everything for him to have this opportunity. And one thing I love about Robbins is he has two years of eligibility. Yeah. Well, and that whole room, I think, is impressive because you have Hinkley Rapati yeah. and you have L.J. Martin and Deion Smith, who is another guy that I, may be one of those guys that's an under-the-radar type situation, the, the guy that came in from Colorado. I, 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 I like the pick of Aiden Robbins. If, I, if Robbins goes to the NFL – after this year or next year. Mm -hmm. Then that'll be four running backs consistently that have gone yeah. in there. Then all BYU running backs will no longer be under the radar. <laughs> That's true. Right? True. But, but I think he sneaks in, and uh, I don't know if, uh, if you know, the, the media around the Big 12 have given him some preseason yeah. uh, accolades because of what he is capable of, what some of them have seen, but... I think he's totally under the radar, and I'm looking forward to seeing him run against Sam Houston. The guy that I went with is on the other side of the football, yeah. and local, certainly coaches and players know who this guy is, but I think nationally uh, is where he's probably under the radar, and, and that is you know, a, a guy like Eddie Heckard, who, by the way, you're going to actually hear from later in this show. Spencer Linton was able to talk with him the other day, so you'll hear that one-on-one -on -one with uh, Eddie and Spencer coming up a little bit later on in the program. But this is one of those big transfer portal additions, especially on the defensive side. And you know that Jay Hill, who obviously was his head coach at Weber State, if, if he's bringing a guy like that in, it's because he knows what he can mean for that defense. And we've already seen he has immediately come in and been a leader on the field. And I was talking to somebody specifically about Eddie um, earlier in the week. And he's not a huge guy in terms of height. He's, he's certainly built, he's, he's strong, but he's not a real big guy. But the person I was talking to kept saying, while he doesn't have necessarily the size, he's always around the football. And he's one of those guys that just knows how to make a play on the ball. And it's all about angles and understanding where the play is going and how the play is developing. And he said, that's why he's as good as he is. We're talking about a guy that was an All-American right. and was constantly big sky you know, first team. This this is a guy I think that uh, by the end of the year, everybody's going to know who Eddie Heckard is. I was talking to Gennaro Guilford, the corners coach, after practice, and he said that. Uh, and I said, How, "How's how's Heckard?" And he goes, "You know, he's just awesome. What his leadership is key, and he's got all the skills you just said." He goes, "But the other guys watch him, yeah, and they want to be like him." And, and when you have a teammate, let's say, it's so different, I think, uh, when, when, you have a, when you have a coach that was awesome, you want, to, you, you want to be like, but when you have a teammate that you emulate and want to be like and play with, uh, it seems to be so, more, so much more influential. And that's what Gennaro said, that what's going on with the, with the DBs is that uh, Heckard's presence and his leadership is, has been as valuable as Keaton Slovis' leadership on offense. Well, and there's no ramp up for him. This is a, a system that he's aware of. Yeah. This is a scheme he's played in. He knows what Jay Hill wants on that defensive side of the football. So day one, he came in and knew exactly not only where he needed to be, but where everybody else needed to be. And to be able to have somebody like that that's so intimately aware of this scheme, I, I just think that's huge. Who are some of the other guys that maybe, may, while, while maybe not the most underrated, that maybe fit into that category? The new receivers... Keelan Marion and, and Darius Lassiter, they come in from uh, UConn and from uh, Eastern Michigan. They've been hurt um, 
Fessy Sataki really loves these two guys. He, he thinks that they've got NFL potential um, and, and that they got them out of the portal when everyone else missed on them. I think those guys qualify for being under the radar that I'm really excited to see. Uh, real quick before we move on to topic two, I, uh, Chase Roberts is one. People know who he is, but because of injuries, he's, yeah. it's, sort of, it's sort of kept right. him back a little bit. I actually am expecting a big, big year from Chase Roberts. I'm really excited to see what he can do as one of those wide receivers. The other guy, now I'm, I'm also sort of uh, projecting here in terms of who will be the starting kicker, um, but I'm going to go with Will Farron. Okay. Um, I, I, I like what we've seen, and I like what I've heard people talking about him. It's a guy that came from Boise State. Kelly Papinga, obviously very familiar with him. said that really the only reason he wasn't the starting kicker up there is because they had a guy already that was so good yeah. that it just, it just wasn't his time. So, I, again, I'm projecting that, that I would assume he's probably the guy that gets the job, not obviously official or anything like that. But Will, Will, who I'm going to say Will Farrell all the time, by the way. <laughs> Will Farron. I think maybe one of those under the radar. Hey, guys. throw Jay Hill on that list, yeah. defensive coordinator. BYU's defense, which was was not good last year, up in the hundreds on most of the categories. If they bring that thing down 20, 30 spots, yeah. that's, that's a few more wins than what people think. All right, our second topic here on this Friday, with the, the Utes joining the Big 12 next season. Was oh, that happening? Yeah, it opens up the future non-conference games. BYU, I think, has six scheduled with them over the next seven years. Um, would you like to see BYU fill that gap with rivalry games against Utah State, Boise State, or which direction do you want Tom Homo to go? Yeah, this is an interesting topic because obviously, you know, rivalries it's something that people will always talk about I and mean, it's it's part of the history and for forever we were talking about you know the rivalry with Utah now that's back on in the form that it used to be you know moving forward I, I, to me I, I don't have an issue with it to me it's less about a, a certain scheduling um, a way to schedule as opposed to who the schedule is for me moving forward w when you know you have nine conference games the only thing I want out of nine, or the, the non-conference schedule is three wins. I, I don't care who it is, but I want to go in and schedule three wins every year, the first three games of the season, whoever it is. Right. So th that's my philosophy. It's, to me, it's much less who BYU is playing. It's the type of team BYU is playing. Because at the end of the day, I just want to go into conference play every year 3-0. So for me, that's kind of how – so if that means – you know, you, you can schedule teams. Like this year, Arkansas, would I put Arkansas on the schedule if we had had more time to know this was going to be non-conference before going into conference? You know, I, I don't know. No, you wouldn't. You Probably not. No, but as an but, independent, you but, certainly but would. But as an independent, you absolutely do it. So for me, whatever it is, my goal would be to just schedule three wins so that you've got three wins out of the gate and then you start conference play undefeated every year. What I'd do is I'd call my friends down in Vegas – my UNLV friends, and I'd say, I would like to schedule six games with you. It's three up here, three at Allegiant Stadium, because it serves the huge BYU fan base down in Vegas to take a game there every year. You're not going to lose a home conference game by taking it to Vegas. Play UNLV. Yeah. Bring them up here. Go down there. Uh, that's well, that what should I do. fit in. I don't know if UNLV would, win. would want that, <laughs> but, uh, but I would want that. And I know everyone in Southern Nevada would oh, yeah. love to have – BYU in the stadium again, and they're not scheduled to play UNLV henceforth. This is an opportunity. A schedule, maybe you don't have to do all six, but, uh, but a home game here is also a home game there. And there's not too many places in the country you can book an opponent and know that you're going to be the home team home and away. Well, you look, as it pertains with Utah State, you know, I, I, don't, know, I don't know how it would work. I would assume Utah State would want to play BYU as many times as possible, but at this point, BYU's probably in the driver's seat. And I'm like, we'll play you. There's no reason to but, go up there. But it's, all the games are going to be in Provo. Now, whether or not Utah signs off on that just to be able to play BYU, that's only something that the Aggies can answer. But, but yeah, BYU probably doesn't need to go to – to Utah State, Ip and to Logan anytime soon. They don't, although my kids would love it, but they, they don't. Um, and then we're assuming that these schools have openings. It's true. Most teams are booked out years in advance. Uh, I don't know who BYU is going to find for September 7th of next year, um, but they got to find somebody. they got to find somebody because that game just got pushed to the end of the year. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, Thanksgiving weekend is what we anticipate. That's right. I, As it I, should be. Yeah, just like it always has been, right? Our question of the day is this. Who do you think is the most under-the-radar player 
for BYU. First uh, answer coming in via Facebook from Jared Chase says, uh, Isaiah Glasker, Good choice. get to know this name. He will become a staple on this J. Hill defense. Also, Jordan Royal on X uh, says, Parker Kingston. Some of these receivers are under the radar, but I'm dying to see what Parker Kingston can do on kickoff returns, jet sweeps, go routes, special teams, gunner, etc. Let the kid run and use his speed. That's something else, too. Got speed. This team's got speed. They've yeah. got speed all over the field, and it's on both sides of the, of the, of the football. I like the team speed. I'm really curious, especially on the defensive side, to see how Jay Hill schemes utilizing the speed. Right, right. Uh, Braden Adams on X, formerly known as Twitter. Twitter, yeah. Uh, he goes with Keelan Marion, and I think uh, he says, I can see a world where by the end of the season he's one of our top three receivers. So confess he's Sataki, who says Keelan has got a lot of Puka Nakua in him as far as what he does with the ball after he gets it. And we saw with Puka, if he needed three yards, he was getting four. Yeah. And if the goal line's right here, no one was keeping him out of it at the expense of his own body on occasion. Uh, now we're watching him do it with the Rams, and we're going to see him this weekend uh, play in the NFL. But um, I, I, that's a great choice. Uh, Marion has a chance to be spectacular and a chance to actually go to the next level from what we hear from the coaches. You know, the, the wide receiver position, I think I've mentioned it on this show before, even before the additions of, of Lasseter, guys like that, Marion, I thought BYU's wide receiver core was in pretty good shape already. Yeah. And then you bring in guys like this that just add to the athleticism, add to the depth, and just flat out give Keaton Slovis more options. I I'm thoroughly thrilled to think about what could be possible through the air with what BYU has at quarterback, the offensive line to protect him, and the wide receivers that Keaton Slovis could throw to this year. Three weeks from tomorrow. There we go. We'll I right, can continue to weigh in using hashtag BYUSN on X, Facebook, and Instagram. Hey, one of my favorite shows is coming back next Tuesday with a brand new episode of After Further Review. Blaine Fowler, David Nixon, and myself. We start breaking down the key players who have an opportunity to be big impact guys for BYU. Guys like Hinkley Rapati and John Nelson and others. They're in the spotlight Tuesday night at 7 Eastern on the BYU TV app. Coming up next, BYU's third all-time leading passer, John Beck, joins the show. Look, there he is. What are his expectations for Keaton Slovis this season? And what does he think of the recent Big 12 additions? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is sponsored by Feastbox Global Grill, a unique dining experience featuring Texas, Hawaiian, and Korean meats. Time to feast. We're live in Studio B with your day-to-day -day BYU sports play-by-play. -play. He's Dave McCann. My name is Jason Shepard. Welcome back to the program. Happy to be welcoming in BYU legend John Beck. He's also the quarterback whisperer, and he's got all he's got a lot of things going on. We'll, we'll get to that a little bit later on. But he's joining us from his uh, from his music room there at the at the compound there, right, John? It's not me that's transitioning to a music career, just so everybody knows. <laughs> this is my oldest son. My oldest son, uh, he's amazing at music, loves it, and so this is his space. I'm just borrowing it for the interview. Awesome. We need to get him up here to play for a pregame show, you know, when he, when he gets I, his band together. I know. I'm trying to get him to do the national anthem on his guitar for the San Clemente Tritons games. I think that would be awesome. Well, that would be That cool. would be awesome. Well, what's this... What's this time of year like for you? Does it get the, uh, the competitive juices flowing now that we're getting closer and closer to college football? I love football season. Uh, I love college football. I love that, you know, especially for my family as well. It's like once I finish up with my NFL guys, I spend that last week, week and a half with the college guys before they start camp. And then it's like come back home and it's just football every day because I got three kids playing tackle football right now. I help out at the high school um, as the quarterback coach, and I get to be around a bunch of former Cougars like Byron Rex, uh, Matt Redden, Dan uh, Dennis Pitt is on the staff now. So that's a lot of fun. It's literally football in the mornings, football in the afternoons and evenings. It's talking to the college guys as they go through camp. I was just up at Dallas Cowboys camp in Oxnard 
yesterday with Dak. Um, I'm communicating with my rookies. Like last night, I was texting Jaron Hall after his game. I mean, it's it's football all day long, and I love it. We're going to talk about Jaron in just a second. To outside of the BYU bubble here with practice, no one knows Keaton Slovis better than you, uh, with the exception of his parents. Uh, what 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 buzz are you getting from Keaton from how camp's going? Uh, so far, so good. Uh, uh, you know, Keaton from from day one has really enjoyed uh, being at BYU. He's enjoyed his teammates. He's enjoyed uh, the coaches. He's enjoyed the entire experience. Um, but now that it's getting closer to fall camp, it's it's that you know that now it's like test time. Now, you know, everything matters. Uh, and we have cool communication during the week of just kind of some of the plays that are happening at practice, how his body's feeling. Uh, it's been a cool experience for me to have that with all these quarterbacks recently. But I'm so excited for Keaton because I know what he's capable of. Um, I have an awesome opportunity to be with him on the field. I was able to coach him all of his spots. Uh, there at his time, his last time during USC, through his the time at Pitt, and now here at BYU. So I feel like I'm very familiar with all these phases that he's had to go through, the ups, the downs, the injuries, the coaching changes, the transfers, the new team, the acquisition of new teammates, the growing and getting accustomed to them to build chemistry. I'm just excited for it for now to all happen. And I think it's also good that, hey, he's going to get two games to start the year before he really jumps into that Arkansas and Big 12 rest of the schedule. How has he evolved? Because you mentioned you've seen him at all different levels throughout his career. And look, he's in all likelihood going to be the third straight quarterback drafted into the NFL out of BYU. What has been his evolution and, and how has his game evolved heading into this year? Well, I think for Keaton, he, he burst onto the scene as a freshman and he did it at a huge university at USC. So everybody's aware of him. And then expectations just skyrocket. He's an NFL caliber player, 100%. And if things go well and he can stay healthy, he'll absolutely be drafted. And I'm sure he'll have the invite again to the Senior Bowl. Um, but, but for me, the thing is, is every quarterback always has things to learn. Whether you jump out on the scene and it looks like you're amazing from the get-go, or you have some struggles in the beginning and it looks like, man, is this guy going to make it? No matter which guy you are. Like the path always has things you have to learn from. And then it always has the unexpected, the injuries, the coaching changes, the, the people that you thought you were going to have all season long that now all of a sudden you're playing without them. No matter who you are, a seasoned vet or a rookie, those things impact your ability to perform. And so I've watched Keaton basically what I call it's the roller coaster of quarterbacking. When you enter the roller coaster, it's not like you get to look at it and say, hey, you know, you know what? I think I can do that. I can see that twist. I can see that turn. I'm stepping on this roller coaster. I can handle it. No, it's a doorway that says QB roller coaster. You do not get to see what it looks like and you step on it. And then, man, whatever twists and turn happen, you're on it and you're trying to hold on. I'm just so happy that Keaton, he's healthy. He enjoys the situation he's in. There's a positive vibe. And then he's bringing all that experience to this new group of guys that are going to gel together. Having a guy like that, that is going to come to the table with tons of game experience, tons of life experience. It's going to help all those guys around him. And then it's the excitement of the Big 12. I think as a fan, as a former player, like everybody in Cougar Nation is excited for this new journey, this new step into the Big 12. John Beck is on BYU Sports Nation with us here on this Friday. We were all excited to watch Jaron Hall last night Got the second half, played the whole second half. Uh, for the Vikings. As I was watching that game, I remember what you talked about uh, when you visited with us about your first experience in the NFL. Everything was so fast, and uh, it, was, it was like a whirlwind, and it seemed like that was the experience for Jaron last night. You know, I think every player, uh, you get out there. I remember watching the number ones, or not, yeah, we had the ones go, I think, in the first game, a series, series or two, but I remember, I remember like seeing Jacksonville and just being like, you know, man, when I look on paper, you know, I've played against guys six foot six, 295 pounds. I've played against guys this big. But, man, for some reason, when they're dressed in NFL jerseys now, they just look like a little bit bigger. And I've played against a lot of guys that ran four four forties, And I know there ain't anybody, you know, running much faster than that. But somehow they look a little faster. And then I remember you get that first completion. And mine was on a little keeper play. And it's like, all right, cool. Like, I'm going to get into rhythm right here. But it is like these things that just, even though you've ran a concept before in college, you're now running that concept in the NFL. And I'm not saying it's a huge difference, but in that moment, 
It's like you're doing it again for the first time because it's happening now at the NFL level. I think that's why reps are so important for these young players. Like you just got to get so many reps because sometimes I tell this to people all the time. Sometimes the lesson that you learned in college, you learned the college version of it and you have to relearn that lesson the NFL way because the athleticism, because of the schemes, because of also the the experience of the players. Like in college football, you do not play against guys that have played in a hundred plus games in the NFL. When you're playing against ones, you are playing against guys that have over a hundred something NFL starts with tons of experience. And that has an impact on things and you have to learn throughout all that. So it was cool to see Jaron get his reps. I always know when I see young players play that first game, it's going to kind of be this little, there's going to be kind of ups and downs, ups and downs. I love when I see him find completions because I say, okay, cool. Like, let's get in that rhythm. Let's kind of get that, that, that confidence going. And then inevitably there's going to be a few plays that he may be a little off accuracy wise. He may be running for his life a little bit. He may have gotten through a read a little too fast. And then they're going to go back on tape and then I go, okay, I can experience this. I can learn from this. All right, cool. I'll be more ready for that next game. Speaking of reps, I was pretty surprised with the lack of reps that Zach Wilson was able to get in the Hall of Fame game. Now, I granted that's an, an additional preseason, so maybe the plan was once the actual preseason game start will be a little bit more, uh, you know, more available to him. But by all accounts, that situation seems to be heading in the right direction. Zach seems to be um, working through, you know, being the backup and learning and trying to gain that experience. That the other side of it, John, you know, whether whether it was accurate or not, the perception was that Aaron Rodgers and Jordan Love that there was just they didn't get along. Again, I don't know if that's accurate or not, and there was always sort of maybe some animosity that way. It doesn't seem to be that between Aaron Rodgers and Zach. I think I think the way Aaron handles Zach is just as important as how Zach's handling the situation right now, too. Yeah, I think the first thing you got to do is you got to take all the expectations that were there to be the number two pick of the draft and to be the guy that started since his rookie year, and you got to toss him out the window. And you just have to say, Zach is a third-year player in the NFL who's played in a number of starts. He has some experience, and now he's getting an opportunity to learn from Aaron Rodgers. Aaron and Zach connected years ago during Zach's rookie year, and they have stayed in contact throughout that entire time. And part of Aaron coming here, uh, I mean, sorry, not here. I'm, I'm, I, I say that sometimes because I'm acting like we're talking like I'm with the Jets' mouth anymore. <laughs> Aaron's deal with coming to the Jets was also partly because he knew Zach was there. He knew what Zach needed, and he's like, I feel like it's a great opportunity for me, and I also feel like it's a good opportunity for me to help somebody that I believe in as I exit the NFL. Right. Aaron knows he's only got so many years left. And a lot of veteran quarterbacks, you see that this competitive thing changes in them early on. They want to step on everybody's throat. All right. That's just the way they're wired. Like they want to win and they're not going to be the absolute best guy at at all times out on the field or in the meeting room. Like they're not concerned about prepping some young guy like they are totally focused on competing and winning and they're driven towards their goals. But then they start to go through this shift. And I think you see it with guys like in basketball, Kobe, LeBron. You start to hear about how much they talk about that thing with their teammates or bringing up a young guy. Right. And they're wanting to share that knowledge like they don't want to exit the league, having gathered all of this and not passed it on. And so I think uh, Zach's in a cool situation because you have a Hall of Famer that's in that phase of his career where he's saying, I want to finish and I want to be able to know that I have passed some stuff on and I've helped a young guy that I believe in achieve his ability like achieve his potential and zach's that guy so aaron has been amazing for him in sharing all that information and zach has always been a sponge since the day that you know i met him and since he's at byu like the dude just tries to soak in everything he possibly can and so it's a great situation because you have somebody wired like zach and you have somebody with the experience of aaron who's willing to share all of it so i think it's a great situation zach will for sure play more in the upcoming preseason games And, like, who knows what's going to happen in the season? Who knows the type of success the Jets are going to have? I also want Zach to be able to, in one fashion or another, get some time during the regular season. Like, if you look at guys that continue in the NFL and get to play a lot of years and a lot of games, and you look at each season, they're finding a way to play in games. Whether it's as the starter or the backup, they're playing in games. Like, one of my early coaches said this, you want to be a better starting quarterback? Be the starting quarterback. All the backup reps you can get in practice, I know that they're still beneficial, 
But if you want to know exactly what it's like to be the starter in practice and in games, you got to be the starter. John Beck's with us. We're going to ask you about why they do it here in a minute. But first, BYU and Utah are now back in the same conference starting next year in the Big 12, which means that big game will now have things that are on the line that were on the line when you played in that big game. How do you, how, are you happy that that rivalry is coming back in that fashion? What do you think? Yeah, I love it. I mean, look, I actually did an interview with Ben Criddle probably like a week ago, and that came up about Utah coming into the Big 12. And I said, I think it would be really cool to have that game back. I think that game's meaningful, meaningful to the players, meaningful to the state. It's meaningful like just to have that type of of feeling in a game somewhere on your schedule. We all play in rivalry games in high school. Well, then you want to go and have a rivalry game in college, right? It just feels that way. It feels right. And there is a huge tradition that goes on there. Uh, and so I made the comment of, I think it would be cool if Utah came to the Big 12. And I remember Ben was like, oh, man, that's not how Cougar fans feel. We talked about it on air. I called him afterwards, and I was like, hey, did I say something that, like, Cougar Nation doesn't really agree with? Like, are there a lot of fans? And he just like, it is tough for a lot of BYU fans because Utah goes to the Pac-12, and they're like, hey, we're in the Pac-12. We're high and mighty. You guys aren't in a conference. And I know a lot of BYU fans wanted Utah to maybe get kind of left out there. That being said, I think it's going to be so cool to have the addition of that rivalry in the Big 12. The BYU-Utah rivalry is a great rivalry. And the thing that's going to be cool for the Big 12, too, is they've also added the rivalry that I grew up with, Arizona-Arizona State. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what a cool thing that this conference brings in. These two rivalries are going to be amazing. And who knows when that's going to land now? Who knows when that BYU-Utah game is going to hit? And who knows what's going to be on the line? You know, Utah right now has a great name. They've been to Rose Bowls, right? They've been successful. Like, they have a name that, like, everybody knows right now. And BYU, what a cool opportunity to step in and say, all right, now we're part of a game that not only is it the holy war between us and the state, but who knows what could be at stake in the Big 12 Conference. What if this is a potential, you know, who goes to the conference championship game? Like, I, I just think that's awesome to have that in, in that conference now. All right, John, as if being a husband and a father and a coach and a quarterback coach wasn't enough, you've, you've added more to your plate. Tell us about why they do it. Okay, so here's kind of how, like, the genesis of all of it. Um, I've had a lot of people that while I'm watching BYU football games with them or after the game, has, they have a lot of questions, right? They want breakdowns. They want to know what's going on. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? Um, and as they learn the game, they're more intrigued. Uh, I have a good friend of mine that as we were discussing things one time on a vacation, I just kind of said, you know, like I love breaking down games. I love when I get to share that information. Uh, I love always trying to learn and I love helping others learn. And so I did a few sample videos of, hey, if I did a site, this is what it would look like. And I sent those sample videos to a few of my good friends that I know are just huge BYU football fans. Um, and my friend also sent it to some family members and friends that were not maybe like you know, super knowledgeable in football. They don't consider themselves football people, but they absolutely love BYU football. They love the games. They love what's going on. And all the feedback, especially from the people that may not be considered football people, was that was so cool to know that that's what's happening in the game. I had no idea that, that like, that's what the quarterback is having to do. I had no idea the offensive line and the running backs were having all of that in protection. So it kind of enhances now their understanding of, whoa, that's really what's going on in the game. And for football people, right, now you kind of get this full picture. Because even for me, when I'm watching the TV copy, sometimes you see the receivers, it's like they leave the field of vision, right? And you're trying to figure out, man, I didn't totally get a good picture on the shell of the coverage. But because of the blitz, I know they're probably here. But, man, what are we getting on the back end? And so sometimes, I'll be honest, the, the tape that I want to see most of all is the all 22. It's the coach's tape. Yeah. Right. But not everybody gets an opportunity to see the game from that perspective and to have people talk through it. And I just feel like nowadays with content and everybody's wanting content to either learn more, see more, hear more. And I thought, man, I'm kind of in a unique position um, just because of my relationship with BYU, the opportunities I've had to do things like this on, you know, on, on, on Sports Nation, on different radio shows like the Wise Guys, the podcast with them. I've just I've been in a unique situation to be able to kind of have like. Uh, connection with the people that follow BYU football. And I thought, man, if I'm connected with these people that love BYU football, 
I can share something with them that's going to give them a greater insight to the games and they'll learn more about the game. And here, I'm not going to be somebody that's critical of players. And maybe there's some people that say, well, man, that's not going to make your site what it could be because we want to know who's to blame. Nope, I'm not going to do that. I'll never do that. But for the people that want to know, hey, man, what are these guys really executing in every single play and get a, get a thrill for that is awesome that that's what's happening. That's what this site's going to be for. Why they do it. And now we know how he's going to do it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you guys should check out. Look, I tried to throw up like, I don't know, I think there's like six or seven sample videos of, look, this is what it will look like uh, each game. I did some on a drive. I think there's like a 20-minute video of a Baylor drive. Like this is what a full drive will look like. I think there's like a, a, a back view of a shot play. There's a couple other talking through some schemes. There's a defensive one where I'm talking through, like, here's what the defense is trying to do. And then there's there's a section called on the whiteboard where I get up. And really, it's it's the immersive experience of if you were sitting in the meeting room of an offensive coach going through tape with you or going through the whiteboard, breaking things down, installing a play and talking through the schematics and the concept read. It's basically giving the fans that. Now, it's taking you and putting you in an offensive meeting room being instructed and broken down by like an offensive coach. And, and where can they find that, John? Just why they do it.com. If you go on there, there'll be like a link for, uh, I think it's called sample videos and you just scroll down and there'll be like breakdowns and whiteboard. You just click on it and there's a little library and I'm going to add some more. I'm going to take some of the games of these, uh, of our Cougars in the NFL. I'm going to take a couple of Jaren's plays, break them down a couple of Zach's plays and right. break them down. And, I have to watch stuff for other collegiate teams as well. And if I see some of the schemes that I know BYU runs being executed by another collegiate team, I'm going to say, look, here's this team executing the same thing. And maybe here's the little nuance, the little tweak of how they're doing it. But it's the same structure. It's the same concept that we used of beating these coverages. Well, John, we appreciate it. Good luck with the uh, with why they do it. Uh, appreciate you coming on and talking some uh, BYU football. It's always great to catch up with you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome, guys. This got me excited for the season, man. I see Blaine in his white BYU shirt. <laughs> it feels like, you know, you got the voices of the Cougars happening. It's football season. This is awesome. Hey, John. That's you, right. You've had your hand on some huge, huge wins. Uh, good luck with that project. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Sounds good. We'll see you. Great, John Beck. Hey, join us tomorrow night. We got live soccer on BYU TV as the 13th ranked Cougars take on Idaho State. Final exhibition game of the season before it all starts for real. You can see the game 9 Eastern time on BYU TV and on ESPN+. Still to come, the NFL preseason has begun. Which former Cougar will you have your eyes on this weekend? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Follow BYU Sports Nation on social media for content throughout the day and the weekend on Facebook, X, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and Threads. Is it totally not Twitter anymore? No, Twitter it seems like Twitter is gone. It is completely but it, gone. But it I is, got an X on my phone. It is now, it is now X. Now, hey, and you can change the app icon, too, if you want to change it to a different color. Welcome back to Studio <laughs> B. He's Dave. I'm Jason. Let's get to today's headlines. BYU football training camp continues with practice today. Closed scrimmage tomorrow. Anytime you scrimmage in the fall, it's usually big, and you hope everyone survives. Other football news, as mentioned, Mason Wake announcing he's stepping away from the game, citing injuries, and we wish him the very best as he finishes his degree here after the fall semester. We've talked about it a few times on the show already. Jaron Hall made his NFL debut last night in the Vikings preseason opener at the Seahawks. Hall played the entire second half and finished 6 of 14 for 37 yards. Kyrus Tonga also with Minnesota, had one tackle and one QB hit. Hey, how about you block for him? Block for him next time. Yeah, the, the, the problem with Jaron being third string quarterback is he's got the third string offensive I line. I think those were the eighth string offensive <laughs> yeah. line. Yeah, some other notable uh, Cougars in the NFL this preseason. Uh, Tyler Algier and the Falcons will be taking on Chris Brooks and the Dolphins tonight. Could see a lot of Brooks. Yes, you could. Zach Wilson and the Jets facing Brady Christensen's Panthers on Saturday. Puka Nakua and the Rams hosting Michael Davis and the Chargers also on Saturday. And the game I will be paying the most attention to, of course. Matt Bushman and the Kansas City Chiefs visiting Taysom Hill, Jamal Williams, and the New Orleans Saints on Sunday. It's a good thing I've got 130 church on Sunday. We're hearing some good things about Bushman. Women's soccer beat Rutgers one to nothing back east. 
on an alley fryer goal in the 80th minute. That was an exhibition game, so they're coming back home and they're going to get right back to business with another exhibition game tomorrow night at Southfield against Idaho State. Weather is going to be perfect. Watch it on BYU TV Live and on ESPN Plus at 9 Eastern. BYU men's and women's cross country schedule was released this morning. Some highlights include opening the season with BYU's Autumn Classic on September 8th and the first Big 12 championship meet for BYU cross country will be at Iowa State on October 28th. They're it's becoming real, Dave. They're running, they're running to win the Big 12 this year. They may run to Ames. They <laughs> probably won't do that. Those are today's headlines. Now let's whip it. Cougar Whip Around is presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. AP Top 25 makes its season debut on Monday. So how many teams do you think will be representing the Big 12 in the Top 25? Uh, I think for sure two. I think there, it's likely three. So I'm thinking Texas, TCU, and Texas Tech. I think those are the three that end up in the top 25 for me. But I'd be for surprised sure if Kansas State's not in there See, as the defending yes. champ with a lot of guys back. But they lose, they, but they lose some big power hitters. And so I, that's, that's the one that could push it to four for me. So Where, yeah. Where's BYU going to be, 11? <laughs> 11th? Maybe not this year. Top 10, man. What are you talking about? <laughs> All right. Up next, transfer cornerback Eddie Heckard on what he thinks of BYU's current wide receiver room and how he's dealing with being a leader among the defensive backs. This is BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation, live from Studio B. Shep and Dave with you. One of the big transfer portal additions for the BYU defense was former Weber State cornerback Eddie Heckard. The Las Vegas native earned All-American honors last season and will be relied upon this year to help lead the Cougar defense. Earlier this week, our own Spencer Linton caught up with Heckard after practice. Eddie, a few days ago at practice, your friend Keanu Hill specifically pointed you out as the defensive back corner that he loves to go up against the most yeah. and citing that you make him better and he probably helps you get better too. What, what is it like to go against this core of BYU receivers in practice on the daily? Uh, it's, it's great for me because I get a lot of different types of receivers and everyone I go against. Uh, you know, Cody is a finesse receiver. Um, I didn't play against him in the spring, but playing against him this uh, this fall camp has been good to get to get get to uh, work more patience with him, just because I know how savvy he is and in getting into his routes. Keanu, a bigger receiver, where I might have to use some of my strength um, and stay more patient as well. Chase is a, a receiver that could run. We got Darius, who is a receiver that could do like a lot of things. Um, he could run. He could getting out of breaks fast. We got Parker that's super fast. Uh, and we got Keelan. He, I mean, he's, I think he's versatile as well to where he could beat you deep or get get out of a break faster than a DB. So I think with this receiving court, I just think uh, I'm getting the best work I could be getting. Like, around, like anybody in the country, I don't think they have as deep as a receiver core as this, as far as how versatile like the whole group is yeah not everybody wants to be a defensive back Eddie because often it's an underappreciated position yeah. it takes a certain level of swagger to go out there and do that so what is it about your mentality and your experience that makes you feel like especially in this defense now where they're gonna be like you're on an island Eddie you're out there alone you're doing your thing we need you to step up how do you handle that pressure and, and work through that um just trusting in what I put in like the work I put in like since I've gotten here, since I've been playing football, you know, like you you just got to take that, take it with full confidence and uh, and just uh, go out. And, and at DB, it's for sure a confidence thing. Like you can't go out there second guessing yourself, worried about the last play, anything. And especially in the Big 12, you can't worry about if you got scored on last drive, you got to just go with the next play. And I think uh, like 
this upcoming season, like it's it's big for like to just have that swag and confidence, like and not care about what happened last play, rather it was good or bad. Like even if you made a good play, you know it's next play because they're coming. Yeah. yeah. This cornerbacks room, and I, I talked to Gennaro Guilford recently, and, and he kind of focused on relying heavily on you and Jacob and Mo Bamba to kind of step up and, and be the leaders, and it's you three primarily as as the main guys. But because there is more pressure on you um, and you have to be on the field longer, how, how has that changed your preparation through camp, knowing that okay, I, I might not be able to get subbed out as quickly? I'm going to be on the field for a long time. Uh, I would say I'm kind of used to it because at Weber State, I played every snap of the game unless it was a blowout. So, uh, And I trust in like Sky, Coach Phyllis, and Kobe and everything that our strength guys put us through like to – have me uh, have the ability to play 100 players a game if I have to. Like, um, they, they've they been preparing us right. I'm, my body is the best it's felt since I've been playing, like, actual football games in college. Like, and I just feel comfortable with my speed and everything that they've got me ready to do. So um, I would say, like, I trust in, yeah, like our strength and conditioning staff and the, those – those uh, doctors in there, so yeah, for sure. I feel good. Um, I'm I'm ready to play a hundred a hundred plays. Yeah. We need to get everybody on the Eddie Heckard plan right now. Can we make that happen? What's that plan? <laughs> What's that plan? <laughs> the hundred plays a game plan. That. That's... Yeah, I mean, I just love football. I think if I mean, I I don't ever want to come off the field, especially. I mean, winning or losing. Like if we losing, I'm trying to come back and make a play. If we win it, I want to keep making plays. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to play how many plays it take. Yeah. Okay, two more quick questions. Uh, number one, what makes this cornerback's room uh, under Coach Guilford different than those that you have competed with at Weber State? Um, I see a lot of similarities, and um, I feel like we all, we all have something else different to offer in the room. Like, I feel like I'm more of the vet. I'm more like the backbone of the group. I feel like Jacob is more the savvy person, the one that, that has like all intangibles. He could do everything. Uh, he could tackle, he could cover. Maury is like the most athletic in the group. Like he can run, jump. He he can make that big play for you. And we got Cam as well. Cam coming in. I, I've been playing with Cam for four years now. So Cam is just like the silent killer that's going to lock somebody down and probably not make as many plays but his guy isn't going to catch the ball so I mean what what else can you ask from a corner like that so yeah I think like even with our corner group we're versatile as well as far as what what we need and you know the coach coach Hill and coach Guilford they're gonna it could help us put match us up on uh different receivers we play around the conference okay finally your coach told me that if he was put in a series right now in his current physical state speaking of coach Guilford yeah. He said, I could give you one elite high-level rep, and then I'm probably done for the rest of the game. He's like, maybe maybe three pretty good reps. Do you agree, you agree with that? He gets put in right now, one elite rep or, or three pretty good reps? One elite rep? Probably not. <laughs> elite. The word elite today is different than it was when he was playing. I think – I think uh, he probably could get some good reps just because he's coaching it. Like he got a lot, a lot of wisdom, and he gonna know what he uh, the techniques he's been coaching. But <laughs> elite is hard today. It's a lot of elite players out there, and it ain't easy. Yeah, Eddie, great to talk to you, man, Thank you. and uh, good luck the rest of camp and end of the season. Thank you. Thank you. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Our question of the day, who do you think is the most under-the-radar player for BYU football? It brings us to our Elite Voice of the Day, presented by PAX Healthcare Elevated. This one in from LPW on X. It says, Ropati. We have a couple shiny new toys in Aiden and Dion, but I think Ropati is being forgotten about and will have a big year. I love that, uh, that entire group. Yeah. All right, today's Rise and Shout Out presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Dave Rose going to the Utah Sports Hall of Fame September 18th. Talked to him yesterday. He's feeling pretty good. 
on a good roll health-wise. Congrats. Absolutely. Our thanks to today's guests, John Beck and Eddie Heckard. We're continuing on X, Instagram, and Facebook. BYUSN.com with all our shows on demand. All right, for Dave, I'm Jason. Shout out to Rod Wilkerson. Go Cougs. Enjoy your weekend.